I've been reading manga for years now, and I've come to completely fall in love with it. The stories that are presented here are so varied, and often unlike anything you can find anywhere else. Even so, I've come to realize that my experience with the medium is mostly limited to things written in the last 40 years or so. Even though I know that the history of Japanese comics stretch way further back than that. So I decided that I would make this little series, where I take a closer look at the deep and interesting history of manga. And I will call it Manga History. Creative, right? And I thought, what better way to start this series than to go back to where it all began, and ask what is actually the first manga to ever be written. Let's get into it. Now it turns out that the question of the first manga to be created is actually a lot more complicated than one might initially expect, as there is a lot of dispute even among experts on the topic. So to really give you a clear picture of the origin of the medium, we have to go quite a bit further back than I was originally planning to. How far back you ask? Well, how about 800 years to start? When it comes to discussing the history of manga, it seems opinions on the topic can generally be put into one of two camps. Those who emphasize the importance of globalization and American influence, specifically after the Second World War, and those who emphasize the continual evolution of traditional Japanese art and storytelling throughout the centuries. If we were to begin by looking at the latter option, then the works that experts seem to always return to are a set of picture scrolls drawn around the 12th century. Among these, the most famous may be the Choju Jinbutsu Giga, often translated to the Scrolls of Frolicking Animals. These specific scrolls are a set of four, and they depict animals acting as humans in various humorous situations. They are meant to be read in a sequential manner from right to left, and while they don't have any text, it's still considered one of Japan's earliest pieces of storytelling using sequential arts, thereby making it the predecessor to modern day manga. In fact, these scrolls in particular have been used as reference for several more modern works, like Gigatown, made by Kono Fumio, the author of In This Corner of the World or the short film made by Studio Ghibli by the same name. This style of storytelling depicting anthropomorphized animals acting out stories continued for hundreds of years as so-called Irui Mono. One of these was the hand scroll painting from the end of the 16th century, Saru no Soshi, or Tale of Monkeys, which also featured some primitive version of speech bubbles, depicting what each character is saying bringing us even closer to the manga style we know today. The next stop on our journey takes us to the end of the 18th century. We are now in Japan's Edo period, in which the country saw a huge growth in culture, economy and public literacy, leading to a lot more books being published. One type of book which was popular in this period was called Kusasoshi, literally grass books. These books were made up of woodblock illustrations, with a combination of text and imagery used to convey a story. Each of these books were usually around 10 pages long, and one narrative could span over several volumes. Some experts would even go as far as to suggest that Kusasoshi might have been the world's first proper comic books. Genres of Kusasoshi are easily distinguishable by the color of their cover. The red books were called Akahon, the black books were called Kurohon, the blue books were called Aohon, and the yellow books were called Kibyoshi. Because fuck consistency, the difference between these lay in their target audience. For example, Akahon were mostly targeted to a younger audience, while Kibyoshi are thought to be targeted to educated adults. Categorizing genres by demographic like this is actually quite similar to how we split today's manga into categories like shonen, seinen, shoujo or jose. These graphic books had already had a long history in Japanese literature, having probably evolved from the companion novels, otogi soshi. 
which can be traced back to the late 14th century. Akahon, the Red Books, are believed to have started circulating around the middle of the 1600s, and types of kusasoshi were still being made in the early Meiji era, that is to say the late 1800s. And because of this, it's pretty difficult to point out any specific point that we can compare to modern day manga. However, one genre of kusasoshi that is particularly interesting are the aforementioned yellow books, the kibyoshi. Kibyoshi is considered to be a direct evolution of the Aohon, the blue books, as they both tended to cater to adult readers, often being centered around life in the pleasure district. The very first major Kibyoshi to be published was Koikawa Harumachi's Kinkin Sensei Eiga no Yume, which is often translated to Master Flashgold's Splendiferous Dream. This was an adaptation of a classic theatrical piece called Kantan, and it distinguished itself with a very modern and realistic type of narrative and illustrations. This work was very well received, and it sparked a boom of contemporary pieces being published in the years to follow. A lot of these would directly reference real-life events or persons, often using them for social commentary and satire. During the second half of the 1780s, the nature of these works became increasingly political. This was a period of great social unrest in Japan, due to a series of natural disasters and a steadily decreasing trust in the country's government and social elites. Some of these contemporary kibyoshi would for example be used for criticism against the Tokugawa shogunates, Japan's military rulers of the time. To get past censorship, authors would mask their messages behind allegories or other literary devices. However, by 1791, the Japanese government had introduced even more strict censorship laws, which not only ended the publication of political kibyoshi, but even led to a bunch of prolific kibyoshi authors being fined or exiled. Despite this, the publication of Kibyoshi would continue for decades, but now without the political overtones, effectively ending this golden age of Japanese political comic books. We are actually gonna get back to the Kusazoshi, these colored grass books, at a later point, as they do make an unexpected reappearance down the line. But before we get to that, we have to talk about some of the important developments that happened during the 1800s. It is said that the word manga first came into usage to describe kibyoshi around the very end of the 18th century, but what would popularize the term was a series of picture books by artist Katsushika Hokusai, which started publication in 1814, titled the Hokusai Manga. And if this artist's name seems familiar, it's probably because he would later on become renowned for his world-famous print, The Great Wave, from 1831. It should be noted, however, that a large part of the Hokusai manga are actually made up of single sketches rather than any sequential narrative, so the word is used more so in the literal interpretation, meaning whimsical pictures, rather than the modern meaning of the word. Now, the next big step in the evolution of manga would come around the middle of this century. The Tokugawa shogunate was overthrown, leading to the end of the Edo period and the start of Japan's Meiji period. The new government was a lot more open to international trade, meaning that Japanese artists were now more exposed to Western culture. A foreign settlement was opened in Yokohama, and here we find the first newspapers to be printed in Japan. The comic book magazine Japan Punch started its publication here in 1862, likely basing itself on the existing British magazine, simply called Punch. The comics printed in this magazine were made to make fun of and satirize the life of Westerners interacting with Japanese people, laws and culture within the Yokohama settlements. Papers like these introduced lots of Japanese artists to Western cartoons, an important element of which being the modern day speech bubble. And it didn't take long before satirical comics by Japanese artists were once again on the rise. 
The very first manga magazine, Eshinbun Nipponchi, took inspiration from Japan Punch and was first published in 1874. It was co-founded by a renowned Japanese artist, Kawanabe Kyosai, but unfortunately the magazine didn't become very popular and ended after only three issues. Another popular cartoonist at the time was the famous woodblock artist Kobayashi Kiyochika, who started writing comics for the newspaper Marumaru Chinbun in 1882. It's even said that Kiyochika studied western style painting under Charles Wergman, the original creator of Japan Punch. More and more manga magazines started popping up towards the end of the 19th century, most of them as supplementaries to existing newspapers. Of these, the most influential would probably have to be Kitazawa Rakuten's Gigi Manga. Kitazawa Rakuten started working for the newspaper Gigi Shinpo in 1899, and in 1902 he started writing their supplementary comic publication that he titled Gigi Manga, which some consider to be the first use of the word manga in the modern interpretation of the word. Not only that, but Rakuten might be the very first Japanese artist to fully specialize in writing comic books, making him the first ever proper mangaka. One of his very first series was called Togosaku and Mokube's Sightseeing in Tokyo, in which we follow two men from the countryside trying to interact with the modern culture of Tokyo. Since the two know nearly nothing about modern culture and technology, this would often lead to some comedic situation playing out, like in this issue where they are trying to operate a fire hydrant. This series, while being very entertaining, also worked as a commentary of the rapid industrialization and modernization of the early 20th century Japan, and quickly became a big hit with readers. In 1905, he funded a magazine fully dedicated to manga called Tokyo Puck, based on the American comic magazine Puck. Rakuten would continue to create manga for decades after that, and would come to inspire many Japanese artists for years to come. Even Osamu Tezuka, the creator of Astro Boy, has cited Rakuten as one of his favorite cartoonists growing up. Not only that, but he also created Japan's first art school to specialize in caricature and comics. It wouldn't be an overstatement to say that Kitazawa Rakuten played a major role in the development of modern manga industry. In 1966, his house in Omiya was made into the Saitama Municipal Cartoon Art Museum, the first museum in Japan dedicated to manga. Even more manga-dedicated magazines started showing up in the early 20th century. Some of the first shonen and shoujo magazines started their publications, like Shonen Sekai in 1895 and Shoujo Sekai in 1906, both of which were released monthly. These types of magazines would continue to release manga in the years leading up to the Second World War, but the most notable of the series released in this period would probably have to be Norakuro. Norakuro was a manga written by Suiho Tagawa, which ran in Kodansha published monthly magazine Shonen Club. It started serialization in 1931 and ran all the way until 1941, and it was one of the first manga to be reprinted in the Tankobon format. That is to say that the individual chapters that ran in the monthly magazine were collected and sold as their own volumes, and this speaks to the popularity of the series. You were no longer buying this only as a part of an assortment of other stories, you were now buying Norakuro by its own. The story of Norakuro is about a stray dog named Kurokichi, who's serving in the Japanese Imperial Army. And contrary to what you would expect from a comic made in this period, the portrayal in the series actually goes against the Imperial Army's favored image at the time. The manga is goofy, and Kurokichi and his men are at times shown acting quite cowardly or stupid. This was at least how it went early on in its run, though I've also heard that as the story goes on, and we get closer to Japan's war against China, it turns more and more into propaganda tales for the Imperial Army, before its initial run ended in 1941 due to wartime economy. 
Even so, the importance and influence of Norakuro shouldn't be dismissed, as it was one of the most popular manga series leading up to the post-war manga boom that was to come. So after the defeat in World War II, Japan was once again open to influence from Western, and in particular American, comics. This combined with much milder censorship laws following the abolishment of the imperial government, actually led the manga industry to flourish in these years. This despite the fact that countless people had lost their homes and were suffering from food shortages in the wake of the war. The country was being rebuilt, and some artists used their manga to express a hopeful optimism for a peaceful future, and few manga from these years exemplify this better than Machiko Hasegawa's The Wonderful World of Sasae-san. You might already be familiar with Sasae-san, as it's famous for being the longest running animated TV show of all time, starting its run in 1969, and still airing new episodes to this day. But before the anime, Sasae-san was a four-panel manga series starting its publication in 1946 for a local newspaper, and later moved to the Tokyo-based Asai Shinbun newspaper in 1949. The story revolves around the titular Sasae-san, and her life alongside her family. It's a very light-hearted series, showing off very mundane yet comedic situations to its readers who were likely longing for that very type of life at the time. Sasae herself was a strong-willed, outgoing and feisty woman, who doesn't really show much interest in getting married, which is something that very much went against the Japanese image of feminine modesty that had been idealized in the years prior to the series' debut. She would always face the problems that came her way with good humour, whether it be during the food shortages of the early post-war years, or the hectic life during Japan's economic boom in the 50s and 60s. Hasegawa, the author of Sasae-san, who'd studied under Norakuro creator Suiho Tagawa before the war, became the first really successful female magaka, and Sasae-san in general became a symbol of progressive ideas and modern life in post-war Japan. It was so popular that it can be considered a cultural phenomenon that is pretty much completely ingrained in the life of that era, and it holds a significant place of nostalgia for nearly every Japanese person who grew up in that period. Now, there is another aspect to the post-war manga industry that I'd like to mention. So far, this entire video has mostly been centered around Tokyo, but these years also saw a development in Osaka-based manga that is absolutely worth talking about. Remember earlier when I talked about Kusasoshi, those colored graphic books that were popular during the Edo period, and how I said we would come back to those later? Well, in the years leading up to the war, smaller manga publishers started printing a type of manga books which were called Akahon manga, named after the red-colored kusasoshi typically aimed at younger readers. Akahon manga was a lot cheaper than the volumes produced by bigger publishing companies, and before the war there really aren't any series here that are particularly interesting for us to look at. But after the war, Akahon manga saw a surge in popularity when the production mostly shifted from Tokyo to Osaka. The fact that they were so cheap to produce made them very suitable for the post-war economic situation. They were also very accessible, as they could be bought for cheap from street vendors around the city. More experimental work started showing up, made in various art styles by artists fueled by the same post-war ideas as we talked about earlier. And the work I want to highlight here is one called Shin Takarajima, or New Treasure Island. This manga was originally pitched and laid out by manga artist Sakai Shichima, and is loosely based on the 1883 adventure novel Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. It features a young boy named Pete and his adventure to a mysterious island looking for treasure. It features a very distinct cartoony art style, and the books quickly became a huge success, unlike that of any of its contemporaries. 
This manga, which was serialized in 1947, can truly be said to have been the start of a golden age in epic manga storytelling, and the artist behind it was none other than a young Osamu Tezuka, who would only seven years later start working on Astro Boy, which would come to change the way manga was told forever. But I think that will be a story for another video. So, there you have it. We have gone from early sequential hand scrolls in the 12th century, to satirical graphic books like Kibyoshi being produced in the Edo period, to Japan Punch, ushering in a wave of Japanese produced cartoons in the late 1800s, to Jiji Manga opening new doors for aspiring Japanese manga artists, to popular long running series like Norakuro getting their own dedicated Tankobon volumes in the 1930s, and finally, to fresh, innovative series like Sasae-san and New Treasure Island, ushering in a new age of manga in post-war Japan. Honestly, you could probably make a good case for any one of these to be considered the first manga ever made, but I think it's much more interesting to see just how each of these works built on what came before it, as well as how they themselves fit into the bigger picture of how we ended up with the crazy stories that we have today. Because I love manga, and I find learning about these types of things incredibly interesting. And I hope you do as well. This is absolutely a series that I want to do more of, so if you've enjoyed this, please consider subscribing to my channel to catch any of my future videos. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Evan God, and I'll see you next time.